My name is Sarah Smith Silverman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a professor of history at American River College, and today's date is October 17th, 2023. So let's start off by establishing the basics. Uh, what's your full name? What are your pronouns? And what's your date of birth? My name is Ayaka Ashley Galvis Torres, also known as Aya. Um, I was born October 9th, 2004, and my pronouns are she, her, or they, them, or, or any, honestly, when I'm cross-dressing. <laughs> So tell me a little about yourself. What are your interests and hobbies? What do you like to do? Um, I am into a lot of things. Um, I like music. I love going to concerts. Uh, I do art, like I do paintings. Um, most of the time though, I'm really grinding when it comes to um, activism because that's what I've done my whole life. I was born an activist, raised by activists. So I'm always, active in those areas. Um, can you elaborate? What kind of activism have you been involved in? I have done activism in uh, a lot of intersectional ways. Um, I, in my high school, I would do um, some student-led activism, like when uh, there was a school shooting in Florida and they were putting up a rally. Uh, they made the mistake of inviting me to be a speaker and I went up there and I just came with the stats and receipts against the NRA. Um, and on top of that, I've, I come from a family that um, organizes protests in the Bay Area. So I'm always uh, showing up to my family's uh, organized protest and support or circles and, su and support. Um, I myself have um, helped with doing research to uh, back up um, arguments for certain legislation of like certain bills. Um, one of the uh, bills actually got um, that I did a little history research on. It was for um, it was a focus on indigenous women um, and removing um, squaw which is a racial slur for indigenous women. It pretty much means um, cunt, uh, a, a, like a way from being um, like named for any towns in California, um, like Squaw Valley, um, which got a lot of uh, racist backlash because they were saying, oh, squaw is just a term of endearment. But from the research I was doing, it was actually a trafficking call, like a human trafficking call early uh, in the days during the time of the 49ers. So they had all of these brothels of indigenous women that they kidnapped um, from their tribes, put them in these brothels, and they had places named across America, you know, during the uh, migration, like things named like Squaw Valley. And that's where 49ers would go, you know, when they wanted to go and exploit women, specifically indigenous women. And so um, from some of the uh, historical research from that, um, with the help of a lot of other um, really important and amazing indigenous activists um, that I know, uh, Governor Newsom passed uh, for that to no longer be an allowed name for any like towns or businesses in California. Okay, so we left off talking about your activism. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about right now with regard to that? Um, currently, my job, uh, I work for Sacramento City College as a student assistant. So I do um, organizing like events for Native, and right now I'm even doing events for Pride. Um, and... Thankfully, because of the platform that my school has um, allowed me with the work I'm doing, um, now I'm kind of doing my own uh, events. It was I never really organized like an event before until this job, like like activist based events here provided by like with the resources provided by the campus, which is really nice. Um, so one of the projects I'm working on right now, I'm getting my my favorite Auntie Lala to come and teach um, trans and anyone else who wants to come 
because it's open to everyone, self-defense, uh, because I think it's so important, especially because of like the political hostility towards everybody right now, especially trans folks, black trans folks, especially, you know, like we had 11, 19 black, or I'm like 11 black trans folks that died, 19 total so far this year that were murdered from hate crimes. And so I know for, you know, when I talked to other trans students or, um, other students where uh, it's very obvious that we don't fit in the gender binary. Uh, we're, we're, you know, a bit in fear because even when we're minding our own business, there's always some butthole willing to roll down his car window to yell faggot at us real quick, you know? And so um, I think it's really important for us as a community to be looking out for the community by doing things like that to make sure that we keep us safe, you know, because we know that the police really don't want to keep us safe. And is that an event being um, co-sponsored by or sponsored by the Pride Center? Yeah, I'm kind of running the Pride Center events right now. So it oh, is... you're running the Pride Center events? Uh, temporarily, temporarily, because um, my... Previous coworker Isabella, she was the team lead who organized all of the Pride events. She had to take leave. And so um, since there's no one really employed under Pride, I'm just keeping it going for now until we get someone new. That's a lot to do. You're working for, um, did you say it was called the Native American Resource Center? Yeah, I work for Native and now I work for Pride too. Um. So where did you grow up and where do you live now? Uh, I was born in East Oakland, California, Fruitvale District. Um, but I was kind of raised um, between both the Bay Area and Sacramento. My parents uh, split up when I was an infant. So I always went back and forth between my dad's and my mom's. My mom who lives out here in Sac and my dad who lives out in the Bay. But for, you know, my first years growing up, I don't remember it that well. It's pretty faint. But um, when I was still living in the Bay Area, it was kind of just like car hopping because this is during the recession. No one could afford housing. My mom just left my dad with only a few cents in her pocket. So we were just couch surfing. Um, and I don't honestly because of that, I don't know where we were all the time. But uh, eventually we made our way to Sacramento. Do you, remember, do you know how long that went on for? That was, from what I recall, I want to say that was only like um, two years of us like couch surfing. I was a toddler. I barely like remember it. All I kind of really do remember is just the toll it took on my mom, you know, uh, just raising a kid, doing school, and on top of that, not having any housing of her own and having to rely on like living with friends temporarily or other family members temporarily until she could get on her feet. Is that how you ended up in Sacramento because of the cost of housing in the Bay? Yeah, cost of housing in the Bay Area was ridiculous. Even though the housing market in the recession was at its lowest, it was still unaffordable because of the tech boom. And so we came to Sacramento because housing was dirt cheap over here. It was the time when not a lot of people were really thinking, oh, Sacramento is a really cool city. It was still when Sacramento was a little bit of a cow town. <laughs> so we came here because it was... It was cheap. Yeah, no, the cost of housing in Sacramento is going up, up, up. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's not at all where it was like, what was that, like 15 years ago when we got over here. It's <laughs> it's insane now. Um, so where do you currently attend college and what do you study? I go to Sacramento City College and I'm studying political science. Um my goal is to get to law school. Why do you want to be a lawyer? I want to be a lawyer because I want to disrupt the system from the inside. 
Um, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> I, I want to become a civil attorney and kind of Aaron Brockovich, a lot of big corporate companies. So I want to go after the companies that are like Amazon that are responsible for union busting um, companies that like oil companies that are drilling oil and then spilling it and then just being like, we didn't do that. Um, <laughs> you did that coming for them. Um, and overall, just like actually trying to push for justice of those who think because they have so much money, it doesn't apply to them. Well, that's awesome. We need more lawyers invested in, in social justice. Yeah, we seriously do. So are you a full-time student or a part-time student? Right now I'm a part-time student, but usually I'm a full-time so how come you're a part-time student right now? My mental health, um, I had two grandparents that passed away and only a few months apart. And it was very overwhelming for me, grieving um, two people that I was close to. Um, and so I got a little depressed. And so I wasn't able to like keep up with all like 12 units so I was like you know for the sake of my mental health this semester I'm just going to reel back and then I'll get back on my feet once I've done the healing I need to overcome my grief. Sorry about the loss of your grandparents. Thank you. It's good that you're taking care of yourself and you understand that you need to be part-time for now though. Um, so when did you start at Sacramento City College? I started last year. This is my second year at Sac City College. Um, I chose Sac City because of the Pathway to Laws program, but also because I used to run around here when I was a kid. And my mom would take some of the uh, classes around here when she was still doing nursing school. And I always liked the campus. It's a nice campus. It's a very pretty campus. How, were you considering transferring from high school to a four year? Uh, no, <laughs> I knew, I knew I could never afford it. <laughs> and also I wanted to, um, mature a little bit more before I go to university, you know, uh, and really learn the ropes of like college, um, before I go over to the university, because at university, they kind of leave you a little bit more stranded than they do at community college. Community college, even if our counseling is understaffed, hey, you can still get a counseling appointment. You go to a university and they got a counseling a a department that's understaffed, you are not seeing your counselor, except for if you're lucky, maybe like once a year, especially if you go to like a really big university. So I... I wanted to come to a community because it's more intimate and that's kind of what I needed for my learning in the early on years. Um, so where are you hoping to transfer to from here? I'm debating. Um, I'm planning to apply to UC Berkeley, uh, San Francisco State, Cal State East Bay, uh, Sac State, UC Davis. Um, so do you take classes online or in person or a combination? combination whatever whatever's better for me usually if it's a morning class I want to do that online so I can be in zoom but be in bed <laughs> do you have a preference between online and in person um I think it really depends on what the material is if I feel like the material is um not so demanding I would like to take it online if I feel like it's something I can teach myself or like right now I'm taking English but I'm taking it online where all I have to do is uh zoom lectures um but for me it's not that demanding because it's just like you just got to do the readings and just like keep up with your work but if it's something like science I need to be in person <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine taking a hard math class or a science class online. I'm sure there are teachers who teach it really well online, but when you don't have that kind of one-on-one, -on -one, um, more immediate support, that seems really challenging. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And those are my, what's it called? Not my strong suits. Um, 
those are my weaknesses when it comes to learning. So those I definitely got into in person. So can you tell me how you identify with regard to your social identities, broadly speaking? So race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, ability, religion, class, and so on. Oh my God. So gender, I'm honestly confused on. I don't know what gender is. <laughs> I'm, I, to me, the gender like um, is complicated. I have been questioning my gender for like a long time. I, I have been doing cross-dressing since like middle school. My boy persona, boy. <laughs> See, this is what I mean by what even is gender, um, is Ian. <laughs> So what I call him, it's like kind of like my drag king persona, I guess. Um, it's it's very confusing for me when I talk about it with my friends. They're like, maybe you're intersex, maybe you're just non-binary, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm one of I, I'm one of them. I'm still kind of exploring that myself, to be honest. Um, but I guess I've been conditioned for like so long you know, because of the societal norms to like only view myself as like this gay girl that sometimes does drag. But to me, it's like, um, I mean, what if it's like more than that? You know, what if it's like, maybe I do want to just be both genders or maybe I just don't believe in gender. You know, it's confusing for me, to be honest. Um, I'm still questioning on that myself, but with race and ethnicity, uh, I am Mexican, Puerto Rican, Colombian, Peruvian, and Native American. So I'm a, an American mutt, <laughs> all American mutt. I have a lot of different cultures that are all very different, but at the end of the day, I'm still brown, <laughs> just in many, many different fonts. <laughs> Um, let's see, what were the other ones? So, um, is there a particular tribe that you're affiliated with or associated with? Um, yes, multi-tribe. Uh, so I know which tribes I'm aligned with when it comes to my Peruvian side. Peruvian side, um, my grandmother is Quechua. Uh, I'm also California native, um, from Cachaya Pomo. Um, Mexican, I, I, I do uh, Danza Azteca, you know, like what the um, Mexica did. Um, though I wouldn't say I'm Mexica, uh, like the tribe Mexica specifically, but I'm um, from this unfederally recognized um, kind of, it's not a tribe, but it's like a coalition of indigenous people that were from like Mexico and Texas before America bought all of that Texas and like all of that land from Mexico. They were kind of like this coalition of indigenous people that were just trying to <laughs> survive through the Mexican revolution and also everything going on in America. So um, we, we have ancestry in that coalition and yeah, it, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> and how, so is it, you said like your mom and your dad, how do you split all of that up? So um, my dad is Quechua. He's the Peruvian and Colombian side. My mom is uh, Mexican and Puerto Rican and the California native where I get, that's where I get that from. Yeah. Um, anything else on race and ethnicity? Um, no, <laughs> I know it's a lot. So the other categories are sexuality, ability, religion, and class. I know it's a big question. So, um, my sexuality, I'm pansexual. Um, I, I don't really care <laughs> what someone's gender is or any of that. If I if I love your personality, I love you. Um, class, I am now middle class, which uh, I'm super proud of my parents and I'm super grateful for them for doing so much to actually get us to be middle class. You know, they weren't middle class. They were they were some hood kids, you know, in the Bay. 
during like the 80s when it was still the real Bay Area. And uh, they both had really rough upbringings. And despite all of their trauma and despite all of the, um, what's it called? Pressure when it came to like financials through their college experiences, they still did it. And because they still did it, I have a much more privileged upbringing than they did. And so I'm really grateful for them to start from the bottom and bring me here. Um, was It was class. Oh, ability, disability, and religion. Oh, um, I don't think I'm disabled. <laughs> I... I definitely have some, um, what's it called? Learning challenges when it comes to like um, ADHD and whatnot. Um, and uh, what was these, the last one again? Religion. Religion. Uh, I, I, I grew up without a religion. All, all I did was really do... Um, like ceremonial practices for my native culture. So like I mentioned earlier, I did Danza Azteca, but on top of that, um, we also did um, a lot of other ceremonies um, and Native American medicine practices. Uh, but I recently did join, um, it's a religion, but me and everybody that is kind of in that religion we make a joke and say it's really a cult because it's so small um i practice uh santeria um can you elaborate on what that means santeria so um we santeria was introduced to um the western world um during slave trade so during the early slave trade, when they were bringing um, slaves from Africa to uh, places like uh, Puerto Rico, um, they had um, the indigenous people of Puerto Rico and um, the slave and the people from Africa, both as slaves. And so um, they wanted to still practice their African and indigenous um religions but due to the catholicism that was forced upon them they had to hide it and so how they hid it was with santeria santeria is um it's mostly um an african religion from nigeria um but it also is mixed with indigenous spirituality and so uh some we call them like uh, santos or something, but they're really orishas as our like multi gods, um, and that yeah, that's the best I can really explain it. Um, so, um, do you identify as two spirit as well? Yeah. Um, do you mind talking about what that means to you? Um, so. Two spirit is um, kind of best described um, spirituality <laughs> uh, as um, people who are trans or people who are some sort of queer. Um, in the tribes, we called them two spirits because the belief was um, that they held two spirits within them, which is why they were queer. But it was more than just that. It was also that they were important parts of their community. They, two-spirit people, we have, you know, before colonization, we were the medicine people. We were both hunters and gatherers. We, we did everything, you know. We were very well respected and even seen as sacred because of, um who we were essentially and how did you learn about what it means to be two spirit for yourself um 
I kind of known about two spirit people um, since a young age, but I didn't really actually learn the proper term to spirit until um, later on when my parents were showing me. Um, my mom showed me this documentary about this um, Hawaiian two spirit lady who um, did a little bit more of a really beautiful in depth of like why two spirit people were considered sacred um, and how uh, her, her like own personal experience of being a two spirit person. And so when I was um, kind of watching that, I was like, oh, that sort of like reminds me of me, you know, because on the outside to people, they would see like, oh, I think we were talking about my gender expression last. Yeah. I think we were talking about two spirit. What two oh, spirit. Two spirit. spirit. Yeah. And then also maybe, yeah, if that's, if you want to talk about how that's related to your gender as well. Okay. Um, for me, at, at first, I didn't know fully if I would be considered two spirit because, like I said earlier, gender is really confusing for me um, because, you know, I. I am somewhere on the non-binary spectrum. I'm not sure yet. My friends speculate intersex. <laughs> um, for me, though, um, it's especially confusing just because of what the uh, norms of society assign with um, gender expression when it comes to like clothing, you know. So you know, uh, for me, I will still wear like things that we consider like feminine, like heels or a skirt occasionally. But to me, I don't really see it as feminine because like high heels, that was worn by men in the 1700s, you know? Men wear, wore skirts. Straight cis men wore skirts and high heels and makeup and wigs and all of that. Or or so they say that they were straight and cis. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Um, but at the same time, I also will um, switch out and, you know, bring out iron, which is my more masculine moments. So, yeah, um, that's why I... Um, after talking about this with an elder um, that I met who runs, uh, she runs Bates, which is um, for a two-spirit organization in the Bay Area. She's like, honey, you're two-spirit. <laughs> that is you being so confused about that is two-spirit right there. Um, so, yeah, I was for sure not sure, though, just because of. The fact that I will sometimes wear things that we consider feminine. But to me, after kind of just like decolonizing my mind from all of that, I'm like, I'm fluid to whatever, you know? Um, is there a particular role that you associate uh, with being two-spirit? Or a particular, um, you know how like a lot of tribes have uh, traditions in which two-spirit people have particular roles and places of importance in their tribes? Is there, is there something that you've thought about for yourself that's um, a particular role? Um, you know, uh, I wouldn't really say that there's like a specific role for me within that yet um, because I am still a youngin when it comes to ceremony, I still have a lot I need to learn from my elders when it comes to my dancing, when it comes to drumming, et cetera. Um, but I guess you, uh, I wouldn't say that's two spirit though, because I know like so many straights as people who do um, in the dancing that I do, they will do dancing, but they also do drumming or like the concha or something. Um, so I wouldn't say there's like a specific rule for me. <laughs> I would just say that they kind of are just like, yes, you are two spirit, but you are also child. <laughs> so you are you are not there yet. But with age and with um, experience and to ceremony, most likely, yeah. 
but I'm not sure yet. I still need to get that approval from the elders first. Do you know if there's a specific tradition within the Kashaya Pomo um, around being Two-Spirit? So I actually wouldn't say that I know much about my Pomo side. You know, we got pretty disconnected from the tribe. Um, My ancestor who does belong to that tribe, uh, she got stuck in the boarding school system. And so that's how she eventually, after she escaped, that's how she met my uh, grandfather. Um, And I know she was actually very important in her community though. Um, I don't wanna say her name or anything because of um, safety reasons. Um, she had written a book that was published that um, I read now. Um, I'm still in the middle of reading it, but I do know that there is a little bit of a section that does um, acknowledge two spirit people. And she wrote this in, I think, I want to say the 70s. So this is like 50. 50 years ago that she wrote um, those passages, but I haven't gotten to that part of the book yet on her teaching. So I'll get back to you on that one. (laughs) Um, Is there anything else you want to say for now that um, about the importance of identifying as two spirit for you personally? And I don't know if you want to say anything about like what it means to be two spirit as compared to what it means to be kind of queer? Um, I think it's important to, for me at least, to acknowledge um, two spirit instead of just uh, putting my label with with wherever I am in the non-binary. I'll just say intersex for now because that's what my friends are always saying. That's probably where you're at. Um, because I am not just like, I am not just my um, sexual or gender identity. I am also a indigenous person. And so the two spirit um, to me is important to acknowledge like, yes, that is um, where my ancestry is at. You know, I, I come from people who knows I could probably have some ancestors um, that are two spirit too you know I I wouldn't know fully I I don't have like um, that full extended history but I have like some speculation that there's probably someone like me in my family or in my blood just a long 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 time ago <laughs> and so that's why I say two spirit because that's to acknowledge whoever that may be. Um, <clears throat> so you said that you use she and they pronouns. Can you explain why it matters to you to use both she and they pronouns? So um, I really don't care. It could be any pronouns, but the reason I just put she in her is because uh it's what people usually call me by especially because like i said like i can have my feminine moments where i'm like caked in makeup skirt and heels you know when i'm really going for some (laughs) when i'm looking for someone who's (laughs) mask you gotta fem it up a bit um from my dating experience when uh because I, I don't know, I switch preference on if I want to get with someone who's mask or feminine. So if I want to get with someone who's feminine, I mask myself up a little bit more. When I want to get with someone who's mask, I fem myself up a little bit more because otherwise they're not into me. <laughs> um, so the she, her is kind of just, uh, it's just there really. But also like that was just my assigned gender. And so that's kind of what I've always been called, but the they, them is really just for my, to acknowledge my fluidity, like my gender fluidity, fluidity, (laughs) because, um, yeah, you know, I do have my, uh, middle moments in the gender expression, what is it, spectrum, (laughs) 
So, uh, yeah, but I also would like, you know, if I'm in drag or something, though, I don't really care which pronouns people call me. I've gotten he, him, too, when I've done the facial hair or something. But, uh, yeah, pr the pronouns to me don't fully matter. Oh, I didn't ask you about drag. So are, do you perform drag? Perform in drag? I don't perform in drag. It's more of this thing that I kind of just do in my own time. You know, sometimes I just, I, I want to experience being a man. It's weird. Um, like I said, I'm going to try and keep this PG-13, but I do have a lot of um, thoughts about being a man instead of being what I was born to be, which is a woman, because I don't know, you know, I really don't know. My brain is just wired that way. It's just something I think about a lot or I think about like, why not be both? <laughs> what if I want both parts, you know? Um, so yeah, whenever I kind of I'm like, I am kind of sick of everyone perceiving me as only just a woman. I have my eye and come out, but I don't really uh, bring him out for drag or anything. Though I am trying to learn how to Vogue. So maybe one day, maybe one day you'll see me on stage. But I do like to support a lot of drag queens. I, I love I love watching Drag Race. Um, and yeah. Um. So can you talk some about your coming out experience? What was the process like of figuring your identities out? And I know it's an ongoing process, but. <laughs> Ooh, so at first uh, it was real rough. Um, I didn't come out to my family first. I was outed actually. I came out to um, friends first because I didn't, even though I knew that my family would probably be accepting, like when it came to my parents, the older generation was on my family. Well, I wasn't fully sure because <laughs> they were very religious. Um, so to kind of just like build myself up for that, I came out to friends first and I was friends with the wrong person. Uh, they outed me. I was only in the sixth grade when I was outed to my entire school. And at the time, no, no one else at school was out yet. No one had left out the closet because we were so young. And so nobody felt comfortable to be out the closet. I didn't, I wasn't even ready to be out the closet like publicly yet, but you know, it, it was kind of just, um, very quickly <laughs> spread around to everybody that that's, what I am. And at the time I thought, um, I didn't know about pansexuality. So I said I was bisexual. And so it was, yeah. Um, and that caused a lot of problems for me, um, growing up in middle school or at least in my middle school experience. Um, because not everybody at my school was accepting. I had, um, kids who would see me on the bus after school and they were like, Oh, that's that, um, queer girl. And I had, um, men, little boys like little little boys you know we there's a weird thing with men where they really like to sexualize bisexuality because they think bisexuality and they think threesomes so they sexualized me because of my sexuality because i also liked girls and so they there's this group of dudes who thought my religion says that you are not a person and so therefore, I don't need to respect your body. And so they would all start grabbing my butt, grabbing my boobs as a way to, I guess, their own like messed up way of just like indoctrination and also just like harassment. And then even with girls, it wasn't fully safe for me. Uh, if I was changing in the locker room, there were certain girls who would be like complaining that they didn't want to get dressed near me because they didn't want me to look at them. It was like, honey, nobody looking at you. <laughs> I'm too insecure myself. I'm looking at myself because I am scared about <laughs> my body being shown to girl. Anyways, um, so that was really tough for me uh, because a lot of kids were really foul. 
Um, I even got into a fight <laughs> in middle school because uh, some kid wanted to call me faggot in front of my my ex-girlfriend, but she was my girlfriend at the time. And so I was like, dang, I can't let you punk on me like that in front of my girl. So I fought him, which is not good. I don't encourage fighting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that that was uh, something that happened. Um, and it didn't really help with the homophobic backlash I was constantly getting from my peers. Um, made people kind of feel enc encouraged and emboldened to then try and start to get me into, try and start and get me riled up to try and fight them for some reason. Like, I think it was a game for them. I think they wanted to have an excuse to beat up on somebody who's queer. And it was, of course, mostly men, you know. Um, and yeah, when it came to coming out to my parents, though, it's a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot easier because one day my mom walks in. Um, I was having a sleepover. <laughs> she walks in. She sees me kissing this girl. Kind of just like slowly <laughs> closes the door. <laughs> walks away. I'm all embarrassed. I'm like, did she see that? No, she didn't see that. I'm like gaslighting myself. She didn't see nothing. <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> and then later on when I came out to her, um, she said, no shit. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Uh, same with my dad. It was not, he was not at all surprised, I guess. They were kind of just like, mm, it's pretty given. <laughs> um, and yeah. So the experience you had in the sixth grade and then the rest of middle, middle, uh, middle school sounds really horrifying. Um did you find any support from friends or staff or teachers? Um, friends, staff, teachers, not really. Um, they seem to, whenever I was facing anything, whenever somebody said something racist to me or whenever someone said something homophobic to me and I went to go say something, they never took me seriously. And I felt like there was never any repercussions for the people who did that stuff. And so... Um, I just gave up with telling them because they didn't want to listen to me. Um, and so the only support I really had was my friends and the friends I made in middle school were was because they came up to me. It was all the kids who didn't come out the closet yet that were like, hey, psst, me too. And I'm like, what? What you mean me too? I'm also gay. And I'm like, oh, OK. And then that became bestie. <laughs> So you had some um, queer friends in middle school that were your support during all of that. Yeah. Mm. And then did you tell your parents what was happening to you or at that time? Um, you know, I was so scared. <laughs> um, they knew when I got into the fight and I had to explain to them. Then they were like, why'd you get into a fight? And then when I explained a little bit um, more of like, he called me a name and he had it coming. Then they were kind of just like, oh, okay. But um, when it came to just like the harassment, I was constantly facing, uh, I wasn't out to them yet. So I didn't feel comfortable fully saying anything to them. But I was also petrified because of, you know, when you're in middle school, there's like the, you don't want to be a snitch. Even though I should have just said something regardless to them, I... I don't know. My my baby brain was too scared about getting backlash from those kids if I said something again that I just didn't say nothing at all. Um, so you said you also experienced racist comments and that you couldn't really go to staff about what you were experiencing. Can you elaborate? Racism is pretty prevalent. And I feel like just about every middle school and high school and, you know, a lot of teenagers, they don't really want to talk about it, but it is, you know, um, my friends were getting called the N word by people who were in black. Uh, I got called, um, you know, Beaner, Spick, uh, Redskin, all of that. I got called Redskin by a teacher when I was in the fifth grade. She somehow ended up becoming the principal of that elementary school. Um, and then on top of that, um, just 
people coming up and asking a lot of inappropriate questions about either my sexuality or um, my race, which to me was really annoying because it was just like, why do y'all treat me so like different? Why you guys, you guys are so weird. <laughs> I had some kid come up to me and was like, do you make a lot of money from like casinos and stuff? And I was just like, homie, my tribe doesn't even have a casino. We are, they are broke. They are, they have no water. They have, no, they don't have clean water. They have to use generators for electricity. What do you mean do I get money? He just assumed because of some indoctrination he heard from Fox News about like affirmative action. He was like, oh yeah, you know, you get a lot of money because you're Native American. And I was like, that's not how it works. I wish, I really wish we got reparations like that, but yeah. So do you remember ever feeling affirmed in your identities in the curriculum by teachers, either in middle, middle school or high school, like Native American studies, history, um, Latinx, history, culture, literature, queer stuff? <laughs> do you remember being affirmed at all? Um, I remember the there being some teachings, you know, um, though I feel like a lot of the time it made me upset because especially when it came to uh, Native American studies, it felt um, it felt inaccurate, you know, mostly because when it comes to um, the history that we study, we read the history from the victors, right? Who, like whoever won these battles. And so when we read up on indigenous people, I felt like they tried their hardest to paint this picture of um, indigenous tribes uh, with the exception of the like Aztec and Mayan empire, but the indigenous tribes in like North America as just being like um, not technologically savvy or anything at all when it was like, no, they were very intelligent people. They had like, yes, they had a lot of spiritual beliefs, but that doesn't mean that they were all spirituality they did a lot of logic too you know when it came to just like intelligence um and so yeah it was like things like that that would really um kind of upset me about just like these incorrect narratives taught about indigenous people you know to try and make it seem kind of try and be slick about pushing that like old agenda of like these uncivilized savages or something like that um, as for queer studies, uh, not a lot really was mentioned for me um, at high school until they hired this one social justice teacher. They hired her on my very last year of high school. And so I ran to take her class and she was the she was the only class that I had um, actually felt like the narrative wasn't this colonial bias she actually knew what she, like she actually knew what was the truth you know um and so she taught me about stonewall um and yeah that was um the most like most scene i felt in like teaching ever was in miss guzman's <laughs> social justice class Oh, her class was actually called social justice. Yeah. Um, and why did you feel like that was important? Like, what did it feel like to be taught about Stonewall? Um, it was super empowering. You know, I feel like in the modern era, whenever I hear um, anything about queer activists, it's all about how. Uh, this queer activist got hate crimes here, there, whatever. And so that's all I ever really known is just the hatred that we get. But to hear more about, you know, the, um, the revolutionary aspect of us, of like our community and at least um, the elders of our community and how they had like, you know, they... They got sick of the tragedy and they were just like, it's trying to tear it up. And so for me, that was really impactful to kind of get myself to learn how to stand up on my own two feet again, you know, after 
being broken down for many years when it came to homophobic backlash. Um, so I'm a little all over the place here, but you talked about coming out to your family and how your parents responded and to coming out. And what about other family? Um, other family, they kind of were just like, yeah, okay. I'd never came out, um, to any of my super religious grandparents, except for my grandma. Um, my grandma was like Protestant Catholic. And um, one day uh, I was like, I'm going out grandma. I was, well, I was staying at her house and she sees me with like my flags and everything. And then she was just like, oh, are you going to pride? And I, was, I look at her and I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> and she was like, I wanna come too. And I was like, you want to come to Pride with me? And she was like, yeah. And she was like, she's like, you know, your uncle Raymond. And she was like, that was my best friend growing up. And uncle Raymond is gay. You think I, do you think I care? No, come on, let's go. And so, yeah. Oh, that's sweet. That's a mm -hmm. really sweet story. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Do you feel now um, empowered in your identities as queer? Do you feel happy? And I guess, where do you find queer joy? Um, <laughs> sorry, my an the answer I thought of in my head is a little foul. Um, <laughs> I find queer joy in uh, yeah, when you could hot back. women approach me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, my queer joy, I guess, would be just being grateful that I'm here, um, being uh, proud of myself, um, despite um, how much, how bad it was for me with all of the bullying growing up, you know, still being resilient, still being here, still being, still being proud of who I am and, you know, not caring. I've definitely gotten pretty good at my comeback. So now it's kind of just like, if I do get some sort of little hate crime, I'm, I just got it loaded for you. Yeah, you know, if you, like, I've, my favorite um, line to say to any homophobic men that, you know, want to say the wrong thing to me is, you're just mad that I get more girls than you. <laughs> Point blank period. That's what it is. <laughs> Have you gotten the chance to say that to anybody? Oh, I said that to so many people. <laughs> and it works every time. <laughs> Every time, especially the incels. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, are there any, do you have any mental health issues or disabilities that you feel like impact your education that you want to talk about? Definitely. Um, I suffer from PTSD, depression, anxiety. Um, a lot of mental health issues, to be quite frank. Uh, I go to therapy, though. I'm working on it. Um, and I am medicated. I take, like, antidepressants, like, uh, Zoloft and stuff. Um, so it's, it's difficult, especially when it comes to my PTSD. You know, I try my hardest to live in the moment. And the moments where I'm not having triggers, that's kind of what my uh, philosophy is, is to enjoy the moment as best as I can. Um, but that's not always an option for me, you know, especially because uh, sometimes I will get a trigger and feel like I am in a traumatic situation all over again. And that um, even though it was like something that happened to me like five years ago, I still am like, yeah, I get stuck and... There's been times where it's happened to me in the middle of a class and I need to run out or um, my anxiety from like a final or something gets way too bad. I have panic attack or something. And so mental health is a real big struggle for me when it comes to um, schooling. But uh, it's something I am learning to persevere through anyways. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of healing. 
but hopefully hopefully it'll it'll get better um so you talked about uh how some of your mental health um issues have impacted your education is there anything else you want to say about that how it impacts you in the classroom and um what kind of accommodations you think you might need Um, as for like accommodations, I would say, uh, I'm really, I'm really good on that, mainly because a lot of the professors here at Sac City are so, are super understanding, like, more understanding than some of my high school teachers, (laughs) like, so, you know, just having to explain to them, like, hey, I'm sorry, I need to step out, I'm like having a PTSD trigger, they... They will let me get a free pass. They're super, they're super accommodating. And I really, I really appreciate them because, and that's another reason why I was like, I'm going to community and so the university because, you know, university, the professors are, you know, they have like 300 students all at once cycling out for 300 more students, you know, professors here at a community college, they have less, less of a load. And so it feels a lot more supportive because you can actually talk to them one-on-one and they will be very understanding. Have you had any issues with uh, professors not being understanding? Um, at Sac City? No, no. I, like I said, I had t- high school teachers that were way less understanding than here. You know, I... I haven't had any professor that hasn't like been willing to be sweet and give me accommodations when I needed it. Um, hmm. So it sounds like you feel pretty empowered to just tell the professor what's going on with you or you say you're having a instead of PTSD trigger and you just say that to the professor. Yeah, well, it's usually if it just like randomly happens in class or something one day and they're, mm-hmm. they, you know, but they can tell, though, I feel like it's pretty obvious, like when it happens, when I go from just like, you know, being chill, maybe disassociating a little bit to suddenly just like screaming, crying out of like two seconds. I think it's very easy for them to like pick up like, oh, OK, you have mental health problems clearly (laughs) go ahead and take a moment to process um and yeah they'll be very understanding about it um so what happens when you have those triggers you said you start to cry uh yeah um it it really depends i i usually i get nightmares um i've told when i've had nightmares that sometimes like like if I'm ever sharing the bed with somebody and I get a, a nightmare bit from a trigger, um, sometimes I can like um, start to just like flail or bleh, flail. Is that a word? I think, yeah, that's a word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> flail around my arms and my legs, kind of like not like fighting, but just kind of just like very like defensive like movements of just like get off of me you know like um or yeah screaming crying it it can really look a million different ways sometimes I just like disassociate and without even like the screaming part I'll just like cry for no reason just like staring off into space it yeah so is there anything um you would like like if you were talking to a professor right now our professors in general right now, and you wanted to tell them what they could do to support uh, their students who are suffering from PTSD, anxiety, and depression, um, what would you tell them? Um, I would say um, be a little flexible with like extensions on work, you know, especially because like Sometimes when you get into a trigger, it's super hard to get out of that. And so, you know, you can waste you can waste some time just trying to, like, 
remind yourself, I'm not in that moment anymore. I'm in the present. And for some folks, it can go for even longer than just like a couple hours. It can go for like days of disassociating, feeling like you are in another period of your life that you're no longer in. Um, Though I would, you know, of course I understand that there are also students that will take a little bit too much advantage when it comes to extensions, you know, but I would say just like being flexible with those, you know, um, without having to make somebody jump through hoops, you know, when it comes to that, like uh, when, when if someone is sick or something, usually they're going to want like, I need a doctor's note to prove that. I, I think that's uh, reasonable, but when it comes to like PTSD, you can't really get like a doctor's note. Maybe you can get your psychiatrist or your therapist to be like, confirm like, yes, they do have these mental health issues, but not everybody can afford a psychiatrist or a therapist. You know, sometimes people are dealing with PTSD and they're self coping. You know, I've seen people who like have the same mental health problems as me and they have no therapist, no psychiatrist. The only way they get through it is like maybe, maybe by like smoking a lot of weed. And yeah, and that, that also can be troubling because, you know, weed has its effects on the brain that can mess with your memory, especially if you're trying to like study for something, you know. But then again, it's also hard for, I guess, um, in those kind of situations, you know, from the professor's standpoint, you know, it's like, I need you to try and keep up with this class, but sometimes people are just um, not ever really going to be in that right headspace. You know, it's, I don't know, it's a difficult thing to navigate through, but I guess all I can really ask from professors is just, please try your best. (laughs) Well, trust what your students are telling you about what their um, mental health needs are and what's going on with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you think your experiences with PTSD, anxiety, depression, do you think that's, your experiences are shaped by being queer, by being two spirit, by being, you know, shaped by your various identities? Can you see an intersection there at all? I know that's kind of a vague question, Um, a very general question. My PTSD specifically comes from, um... Uh, experience I had from being assaulted but it isn't really related to um, I would say my queer identity however I would say um, as as for my two-spirit identity um, you know I believe in generational trauma so like like I mentioned before how I had um, you know indigenous elders ancestors of mine that have experience things like the boarding schools or um, have told me stories about our um, tribe of um, how the settlers had came in and burned everything down and terrorized. And even though I wasn't there and I didn't experience it, I only heard the story of what had happened. It's very saddening and it's still heavily stuck with me in a way that it is something that um, is kind of a depressing thought that I can have, you know, like day to day sometimes. Um, And so I would say my mental health has definitely been affected in a way of just being an Indigenous person. And I think a lot of other Indigenous people would agree with me about um, you do inherit a lot of generational trauma Um, and it it doesn't even just apply, I think, to indigenous people. I think it applies to people of color in general. So I haven't asked you too much about your class background. I know you said that, um, your parents were more low income than you were growing up. So, but can you talk a little bit about your class background and, um, yeah, what your experiences were like growing up and how that changed over time? Um, yeah, so, uh, like I said earlier, um, my parents are split up, so I went from house to house. Um, my dad 
his job is um, a director for a nonprofit. Um, so he he makes a, a, a income that is able to like it's affordable <laughs> for like he can afford the bay barely barely but he can afford the bay area still with his income um uh with i was mostly at my mom's house though um so i would say i give my mom a lot of props to um raising me in a like really like big beautiful home in a middle class area because um you know she was a single mom went through nursing school nursing school gave her a lot of hell especially because um you know there wasn't a lot of uh diversity when it came to the nursing training and so she had gotten a lot of microaggressions thrown at her you know throughout her experience and so um yeah she is wonder woman to me she gave me she went through hell to give me a beautiful house and a big bedroom with like nice furniture. So yeah, I, I love and respect my mom a ton because of all that she's went through to provide me those things, you know? It does, I mean, I, I do like get a little bit sad about it though, you know, because she had to work a lot in order to provide that for us. And so she wasn't home a lot of the time, you know, I feel like a lot of, like, you know, people with, like, parents who are in the medical field, they can kind of understand, you know, like, that experience of, like, them working, like, 12, 14-hour shifts, and that is the norm. They, that is the norm. They will not be, they will be gone for 12, 14 hours, especially if, since my mom was working night shift, you know, when I was home with my mom, my mom was knocked out <laughs> from working, and so growing up, you know, I had to just kind of be in my room, be quiet, try not to wake my mom up so she could go back to work to continue to pay the bills and all of that. So was your mom, I know, well, what does your dad do again? You said your dad is a director of a nonprofit. What kind of nonprofit? So uh, his nonprofit is called Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice. And the reason why, he, um, the type of work he, his nonprofit really focuses on is, um, in their ways, fighting against the um, police and pris prison system. So um, one of his main focus is is um, helping out incarcerated youth. And the reason why he does that is because he himself was, um, when he was a youth, he was incarcerated. Um, he got caught up, you know, um, with uh, the wrong people, but the people who showed him a lot of love when he didn't really have that kind of um, supportive community he felt like from his family because his dad was, um, you know, very abusive and had a lot of, um, had a lot of traumatic effects on my dad. And so my dad, um, you know, uh, caught some case um, and the policing si or the prison system, instead of seeing my dad as um, this teenager that has a lot of trauma that um, did what he did because of a path of, of, of a, the system constantly failing him and leading him to that path of making a wrong decision that he had has learned from and which is why he's doing his nonprofit work they they didn't see that you know they didn't see they didn't have any empathy towards his situation even though they were still trying to arrest a child essentially he was still a teenager he was not yet an adult and so um what his organization focuses on is helping um youth and even people who are not youth people who are have been um incarcerated um get themselves kind of back into um society the best they can um and also doing advocacy work on a legislative level to um help uh grant more rights to people who are on like parole and stuff um one of the propositions he was um advocating for a lot back uh, a couple years ago, um, I forget the number of the proposition, but it was 
pretty much to grant people on uh, parole the right to vote. Okay, we left off and you were talking about your uh, your dad's activism and, and his nonprofit. Yeah. Um, so he focuses on helping people who are um, affected by um, who were formerly incarcerated, incarcerated, impacted, or families who um, had members of their family who were victims of police brutality. So he kind of, um, a lot of his activism work really focuses on just fighting back against the police and prison system. Um, one of the propositions that he uh, helped with a couple years back was helping um, advocate for, it was a prop that uh, people voted on. I forget the number. It was um, to help people who are on parole earn back their voting rights, you know, because one of the things we have in America is that if you have ever went to jail uh, or if you're on parole or prison, I mean, not jail, um, you can't vote anymore which is um, really messed up, you know, because voting is super important, you know, and it, especially when all of everyone is going to be voting um, about like changes in policing, changes in the prison system, and the people who have experienced that firsthand aren't even allowed to vote on it. You know, it's unfair. It's undemocratic. So, um, yeah, that was one of the propositions that he helped with. Um, so was he incarcerated? You said in his teenage years, so it was before you were born? Yeah. Okay. So when you were, after you were born, he was, he wasn't in prison anymore? Yeah. Did he have to deal with the parole system? And was he still dealing with all of that? Um, he had me when he was uh, about to graduate college. And so by then, I think the uh, parole that he was on was over already by the time he was about to finish college. But I think he was um, still dealing with that when he first started college. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. I, was, I wasn't there. <laughs> mm. Okay. Okay. So you said that you work for the, well, I guess, can you just talk about your work experience, uh, where you work and, you know, how do you get by financially? Yeah. Um, I work here uh, in the cultural engagement center, specifically the Pride and Native Center. Um, as for like the income um, you know, income is really funny to me because, um, I, I am still so young. I don't know what is good income, you know? I know that the minimum wage that we, that, like, is currently approved in the States is usually not typically a livable income, but, um, I am still still so young. I am still only just starting my, you know, career uh, when it comes to working. You know, this is uh, what, like my third job ever. <laughs> so I don't know much yet, I would say, um, when it comes to financials. I'm really just trying my hardest on saving up to one day maybe even have my own apartment. But as of my financial plan, um, I am nowhere near close to being able to live on my own. So I am living with my parents for a good while. <laughs> and that is kind of just like what I think everyone in my generation is that, you know, I, a lot of people at my age are kind of just accepted that I am going to be stuck living with my parents or depending on my parents for a while because this economy does not really um, look out for the youth or college students at all. It milks us a lot, actually. <laughs> but it milks the working class. And I would say Gen X, I think. Gen X and millennials, they, they get screwed over the most in this economy. My generation, we are just, you know, Gen Z, we are just like, 
we are just being introduced um into this adulthood and so it's a uh, <laughs> it's something <laughs> so what was your experience like getting hired um and then at your current position and i guess just how do you like your job so far uh i love my job i love that i am pretty much getting paid to focus on the things that i really think are important before that i was working at carl's juniors um and that 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 job sucked <laughs> i think everyone who has ever worked fast food always every always nobody likes working in fast food it is very miserable in this case um i'm really happy at where i'm at right now because instead of having to rush to get people their burgers and getting milkshakes thrown at me when they think i'm taking too long um i get to actually have human interactions with people and not get disrespected by people in a drive through um i get to actually do some sort of work that helps people which for me is really fulfilling because i uh career wise i've always wanted a career that would essentially help better people you know because i know that this world is really unjust and that people go through a lot everybody has something going on in their lives and they need help in some sort of ways and a lot of the time you know a lot of folks are stuck having to just defend themselves and um what my job does is even though we do events um i also can help students you know who have uh counseling or therapeutic needs or need somebody to just advocate for them um or help them around college and to learn the ropes. And so yeah, it may not be a huge impact of help, but it's still helping them. And so that's why I like my job. And given your experience, what do you think the college could do in terms of providing more resources, staffing to support both the Native Center and the Pride Center more so than it currently does? Um yeah, I guess that's the question. Anything you think the college could do better? Oh my God. Okay. Um, counseling, super understaffed. Need more people in counseling. Um, I think possibly even giving um, people who work in like counseling a little bit more of a raise to make it a little bit more appealing because they are they are tired. <laughs> I know that department is tired. Um, as for uh, indigenous students, uh, there's a lot of indigenous students um, that I work with. They are single parents. They cannot be full-time students because they have children that they are looking after while also simultaneously working two jobs, going to school so that way they can work just one job and actually make a livable income. Um, but they don't have anyone to watch their kids. So I would say uh, we have this um, playground um, for people who are researching childhood development, um, turn that playground that is often, you know, left empty into a child care center, you know, so that way students who are studying to be like, um, like elementary school teachers or people who are um, maybe going into like pediatrics or something, they can still, you know, watch the kids, have it be related to whatever they're studying, but also it would be a safe space for the kids to be close by and the parents to also get a space so they can go and study without having their like, you know, four-year-old being like, mom, I'm hungry. You know, go get me, go buy me this, you know? So I know there's a childcare center now. I imagine that it's limited, it's in, limited in its capacity and it probably is not totally free for low-income students either or lower middle-class students. Um, so do you think that they basically should just expand their, I mean, this is what you're saying, right? Expand their childcare center and then provide affordable or even free childcare to students? Yep, I would say free childcare for the students who cannot afford it at all and affordable child care for, you know, um, folks who maybe do have some sort of funds to really pay for it. Though, um, you know, for a lot of cases, if you're a college student, 
it's most likely not the case. Um, but yeah, I would say that. Um, also, when it comes to promise grants, you know, um, promise grants are the ticket to getting a lot of financial help if you are a college student, but they only apply to full-time students. And, you know, um, a lot of part-time students, they are part-time for a reason. They have a lot on their plates that they need to juggle through. And they need, most of the time, I would say a lot of part-time students need that financial, um, let's call it support, the most. And so I would say maybe, I don't know, I wouldn't say that this is something that the school needs to do, but whoever is in charge of that grant to open that grant to part-time students as well, because that promise grant is uh, their ticket to financial stability to get them through college. So is there anything else you can think of that you think um, the college could be doing? I think we should also expand on our basic needs. Um, I know basic needs, they do a lot of important work, you know, and I don't want to disregard all of the work they already do, but I also think that there should be a little bit more funding towards them, you know, so they can provide even more of those basic needs, um, such as like, uh, like um, student affordable housing. You know, I remember a while back there was like this, survey being passed out by my school or emailed um, to everyone in the school about um, if they should build dorms at Sac City. And I was all for that. (laughs) I think it would be a wonderful idea if it was possible for just like most community colleges to have like a dorm or like doesn't need to be a lot of dorms the same way we do at university, but just some dorms (coughs) for students who... um, can't afford housing because there is a lot of um there's a fair amount of community college students who are houseless or low income like a fair amount so for the houseless students especially i think that the dorms would be a great idea for them there are a lot of queer students who are still living at home in situations that are not good for them as well that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of people who could benefit um, from having dorms that maybe are just struggling with their housing situation, whether it be um, mentally or financially or physically too. So are you out at work? Out? Yeah, like out as queer? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, My former supervisor's Also queer. It was uh, really funny because when um, they asked like, oh, um, where are you? Like, are you are you pansexual, bisexual? We were both like, oh, we're both bisexual. Ah!" (laughs) It was a cute moment. It was a real cute moment. How about Carl's Jr.? Oh, Carl's Jr.? (laughs) Oof, no. God, no. I... Uh, People who I worked with at Carl's Jr. that went to the same high school as me, they were well aware. People who worked at the Carl's Juniors that did not know me that well, uh, I couldn't say nothing. They were, um, a lot of the women there um, were immigrants from Mexico. And um, the thing is, in Mexican culture, you know, like it is, it can be a real machismo, a little conservative and you know, I, I noticed a lot of crosses. So I was like, I don't know where you stand on this. So I ain't, I'm not saying nothing. I'm just here. I'm just here to get paid. <laughs> and get milkshakes thrown at you. <laughs> and get milkshakes thrown at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so do you get regular hours at your work? Yeah, I can. Um, I can. I, that, that's the other thing I really love about this job. Super flexible hours. I get to choose my hours whenever, and it's so flexible. And one of the other many reasons I really like my job right now, because I can come in whenever I want. If I want to get like an extra couple hours on like a Tuesday or Thursday, even when I have class, my boss allows it. And so that's really nice. 
That is really nice. I feel like the thing now about service, the service sector and what most college age students um, or whatever that means, college age students, whatever the work that they do, it's usually part time and they week to week, they don't know what their schedule is. And sometimes they get too few hours or they get too many hours. So it's nice to have that flexibility. Um, so I want to talk more about education before we wrap up. So I have a lot of questions here, but I'll start with this one. Um, so what's been your experience so far taking classes that either wholly or in part focus on queer and trans topics? Um, I would say recently, the ones I, the recent classes I've taken, I would say my experience is good um, because I learn about uh, a lot of cool icons like uh, Martha P. Johnson, you know? Um, so like kind of, I would say um, necessary motivational his uh, queer history, you know? Uh, I think history is like one of our most important subjects um, to know because a lot of the things that we are still experiencing have always been happening. And there has always, we think that nobody has ever fought back against it, but there has always, always, always been someone fighting back against whatever, you know? And um, when it comes to queer history specifically, I think it's super important for um, all queer folks to know about the history, I, even though it can be mostly traumatic um, and triggering, there are still a lot of really beautiful moments that I think um, are worth um, witnessing. Like uh, one of my favorite documentaries is um, Paris is Burning, um, which uh, I'm sure if you've ever seen, you know, it is, it has, it's sad, sad moments, but there's also so much life and like beautiful things we ourselves could never physically witness. But because of the technology we have with film, we get to witness it in a way. And it's 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 a beautiful thing. So do you think the classes that, so are there specific classes you can think of that you took that were pretty queer inclusive? Um, yeah, I took, uh, I would say history classes, which is why I brought up um, history. Some of my history classes had um, had some chapters when we got into uh, like the civil rights era, a little bit past the civil rights era um, to acknowledge um, like queer activism, you know, and um, where <coughs> where it started, its origins, um, et cetera. Um, and so those were a lot of the good experiences I had in class when learning um, about queer studies is mostly the history. Um, as for like health wise, I taken like a sex ed class. Um, <coughs> It was pretty weak. It was kind of was just like um, trans people exist. And then that was the end of the lesson. <laughs> it was like, thank you. Was that in high school or college? That was in high school. That's not that's a pretty common story. I've heard. Yeah. Um, why do you think it's important for um, classes to uh, include the queer and trans experience? Because there's still so much ignorance, you know, um, Right now, we got so many right wing bigots that want to completely erase um, any sort of teachings of just the fact that like we exist and we sh we deserve basic human rights and to be treated as equals. And so they're like equality. No, you know, like they, they're just doing the most when it comes to their bigoted backlash. And so because of that, it's like that is the exact reason why we need to be teaching about it to students because of those bigots that are so like uneducated about like queer identities in general. There's they're queer and trans identities. They're largely, there's a large um, bias and a large miseducation about um, 
what it means to be trans or what it means to, you know, be gay, et cetera. Um, and so it should be something I feel like is talked about in class spaces a lot more because in those class spaces, you will always, 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 every class I have been in where we have brought up uh, queer subjects, there is still always going to be somebody who learned about it and it will feel the need to raise their hand and be like, okay, but I still don't agree with it. It's like, it's buddy, you don't need to agree with it. Agree with it. Just don't sit there and erase us, okay? Don't sit there and act like we aren't like valid human beings, you know? So yeah, I think for all rebellious reasons, we gotta continue pushing for queer studies. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. If we had a curriculum that was more thoroughly inclusive of queer and trans experiences, it's hard to, um, like, throughout the country, it's hard to imagine that this um, transphobic and homophobic backlash would be quite as intense as it is now, right? Mm -hmm. um, how about, like, what's your experience like been taking uh, been taking classes that cover queerness through an um, you know, in a, in an intersectional manner, like uh, one classes that have actually talked about the experiences of uh, queer people of color, for instance. Um, typically, when I do learn stories about um, people of color who are also queer, um, it can be. It is. It is usually a tragic mix of empowerment. You know, like like I mentioned earlier, you know, our uh, icon, Martha P. Johnson, she she was amazing. Marsha P. Johnson. Huh? Marsha? Yeah. I said Marsha. <laughs> That's oh okay. Marsha. <laughs> Marsha. Repeat that sentence. <laughs> Marsha P. Johnson. She she was an icon and learning about her story for me. It was very empowering. However, it, it also did make me really sad, you know. Um, so I think it is always important to highlight uh, people of color who are queer and just, you know, queer folks in general still, um, despite, um, despite, um, the bigotry trying to erase our stories, you gotta scream the stories even louder, you know? Um, because I feel like, especially um, black trans people, you know, they are, they are uh, under attack, you know? Like, and we, the community, we ought got to look out for them and also acknowledge that intersectionality as an aspect because um, when uh, we look at all of the trans people who have been murdered by hate crimes right now, most of those trans people are Black. And we um, need to acknowledge that because there is it is not just the component of them being trans, it is the component of them also you know, being Black and knowing Black history in America and understanding that their the hatred towards them is a lot more amplified because they are not just trans, they are also people of color. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make. Um, well, have faculty done anything in the classroom or what have faculty done in courses that aren't necessarily focused on queer and trans topics uh, to make you feel included uh, or even excluded, actually, in the classroom? Have you had experiences with faculty who have done anything that make you felt sort of on the outside? Um, uh, I would say the times I've felt outside would be experiences on high school, you know, where I've been told to, like, shut up <laughs> about whatever um, class discussion was happening. And because I would call out somebody for saying something that was bigoted, they'd be like, hey, sh shut up. I'm the teacher. I talk now. And I'm like, I can't defend my community for a second. 
<laughs> you know, somebody just said something super homophobic. Can I like, can I respond, you know? Um, but as for college, I would say uh, even when they aren't teaching about LGBTQ and plus studies everywhere I go, uh, I know it's a safe space because there are pride flags everywhere. And that's how I know it's a safe space, you know, despite um, the difficulties we have with, uh, you know, like, obviously not everyone is going to agree with that, agree. Um, there are still students on acr going across all the Los Rios campuses, like posting up like Nazi symbol, like tagging Nazi symbols or tagging something like bigoted or whatever or doing microaggressions i had like uh i had a pride sticker on my bumper and i had a neighbor rip it off because he wanted to be a dickhead so i went and put two more <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah that's kind of what i my i would say why the pride flag to me is super important to post up everywhere because that's how you know i'm safe is there anything else you can think of that faculty have done or could do to make queer and trans students, including, you know, particularly que uh, queer students of color, feel more seen and included in the classroom? Um, like I said, you know, our school posts up a lot of pride flags, you know, I feel like and just about like 90 percent of the classrooms I walk into there is a little pride sticker in the corner of the door, a little, little pride sticker somewhere, somewhere. Or there is something super liberal posted up on there and I'm just like, yeah, safe. <laughs> I think maybe SCC is doing a better job at, at that than some of the other schools, as far as I can tell so far. But um, so have you been in classrooms and your professor has shared their pronouns and asked students to do the same? I have been in classrooms like that, but I have also been in classrooms um, where they don't do that. You know, um, I think it really depends on uh, the professor because there is still some professors who are kind of just, you know, they're old school. So they're kind of just like, what are what is this? pronoun mumbo jumbo the kids are talking about but um for those who are aware i do see that a lot and <clears throat> so have you seen a have you seen like what's your ex your experience overall is that mostly professors not sharing their pronouns and ask student asking students to share their pronouns or is it like how where's the balance there um uh, I would say I see more of professors not sharing their pronouns or asking for pronouns, but if somebody wants to clarify what their pronouns are, they usually are very, like, respective of that. You know, I think it's something, though, that um, for a lot of straight folks, they're kind of still, it's still something that's very new to them, you know, so they're kind of, they forget, but I think it's always important to, like, take up space and remind them. <laughs> Um, so in those instances where professors have asked uh, students to share their pronouns and shared their own pronouns, how has that made you feel? And why do you think it's important for queer and trans students, for professors to do that? Um, makes me feel seen, makes me feel safe, um, really helps, um, take away any fears about um, being like misgendered or um, any any of that. For me, like I said, I don't really care what pronoun, I take any pronouns, but for folks who, you know, are trans, it's like I literally went through so much to be addressed as she, her, or he, him, or whatever. Um, and it's disrespectful, you know? it's so disrespectful if you misgender somebody. So I think it's always important to just like first meeting, what are your pronouns? So that way you just never like accidentally cross that line of disrespecting them. Um, so, so far in college, have you ever felt 
harassed, discriminated against? Um, have you experienced bias because of your queerness or your other identities while in college? Um, there was an instance. Uh, we were having a drag show in the library. Um, and all of a sudden, the lights went out. Total blackout. We were sh so we started, me and um, my supervisor at the time, who I mentioned earlier, who is the same, um, same pronouns and identity as me. So we start scrambling. We're trying to, um, we usually use like the internet to get students to come to those kind of events. So we were like, oh crap, um, no, no electricity. What do we do? So we got flags and we walk around campus. We are screaming, drag show in the library, come. Um, no, we were facing no issue whatsoever until we walked past a, a group of a bunch of cis men who start yelling some stuff at us. Um, I couldn't really hear well what they were shouting at us because we were lo yelling louder. Uh, so just kind of had to direct away. But from what I could tell of what they were yelling at us wasn't nice. Um, and so that is the only experience I really have um, on this campus so far of like um, a homophobic experience, you know, or a experience of, um, oh, no, wait, that is not true. That is not true, actually. No, there is one other experience. Um, there is a student. There is a student. Um, like I said before, I, I work um, like in the Pride Center. Um, he started, I think, to fetishize me because, you know, like the weird fetishization of pansexual or bisexual women it's weird um but when i looked at his instagram super religious kook this man was talking about burning gay people like craziness yet he was coming into the pride center every day trying to spark up a conversation with me like he didn't think like really like messed up thoughts about queer folks so for me that was just huge red flag and so i on top of that i also felt really uncomfortable around him because i felt like he was um like like trying to hit on me a lot you know or like like was had like a weird interest in me you know um and so that took me a while to actually get um the dean to take me seriously about that particular student and why it was um, threatening. It was threatening to me, you know, especially because I know this man is homophobic, yet he keeps coming into the Pride Center. It's like, what were his intentions, really? I will never know. He's not allowed in there anymore. But for me, that was kind of a bit um, of a anxious moment <laughs> because I was real paranoid of him trying to plan out some sort of like weird attack on the Pride Center because I knew he was homophobic, yet he kept coming around. So to me, it was very suspicious. Yeah, it's really scary. It, yeah, it's it was something. Not thankfully, nothing had, I don't know. He, I wouldn't want to say nothing has happened because that is still something that is kind of ongoing. Um, but yeah, I would say that's like my most negative experience when it comes to homophobia um, on campus is just being very, very uncomfortable um, with uh, the pride space being invaded by someone I know who is a homophobe. And how long did it take for that situation to be dealt with? You said it's sort of ongoing. Still, it's though. still being dealt with. It is so still, I, he's it's, still coming around? He's not coming into the center anymore. Okay. But because of we have like Instagram accounts for Pride and for Native, he started just following the accounts. He's like liking the pose and then unliking, like doing the most to try and get like our attention for some reason. And then the creepy thing, one of my coworkers, he found on Facebook 
and try to match with her. You like you know how Facebook has that dating site? Yeah, I totally forgot about. It. Yeah. He went on the Facebook dating site trying to match with her, and then he somehow found like he's just he is one of those social media stalkers, and it's 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 creepy, but. It's that they're like, it can't be considered stalking because it's only through social media. But I'm like, that's still. Yeah. So. I don't know. I think he finally has realized after I had said something to the Los Rios police and to the dean that he tries anything. He is screwed and will and will get kicked off campus if he does try anything because I. I saw, I saw him come in a mile away once I saw all those homophobic posts he was making and the fact that he was in the Pride Center, I was like, mm-mm, so. Yeah, and the Pride Center is a small space. I mean, even if it were a big space, it'd be really scary, but, and there aren't often that many people in there, right? Yeah, it is a small space. And then on top of that, there's not, like there's two exits that we could take in case of an emergency, but yeah, it's something. Mm. okay anything else you want to say in response to that question so about feeling bias harassment or being you know discrimination because of your queerness or your other identities as well well in college Mm, i would say that there's definitely a bias on just people being like oh you're just like this like radical leftist that won't shut up you know but like if people can be open to listening to folks who are on the liberal, moderate, or conservative spectrum, why can't you guys also listen to somebody who's a little bit more on the radical left, you know? Like, yeah. But then again, this is America. We we say this is for, uh, we say we're democratic, but we're really not. Okay, I'm going to try and wrap up, even though there's a lot of questions I could be asking, but so is there anything you can think of that the college should do to make queer and trans students feel more included in general on campus? Um, Post up more pride flags. Uh, Also, I would say um, we have security cameras and um, things like that, but I think we should, um, for safety reasons, get a little bit more security um, to help out um, and prevent any um, possible hate crimes. You know, there is a lot of things that happen on campus that students don't really know about, only staff will hear about through some sort of loophole. Um, But there is some like scary uh, bigoted backlash across Los Rios in general, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like we have somebody who for years, years, they have dedicated so much of their time throughout years to go and spray paint Nazi symbols all throughout the campuses. Por qué? Like, (laughs) yeah. yeah. But they do that because they want to keep us in fear and they want us to shut up, essentially. But we can't let that happen, you know? And so that's why I say more pride flags, more... um, more safety measures for trans and uh, queer folks. So that way, in case of an emergency, they don't have to be in fear of dying, you know? Anything else you can think of, um, like with regards to bathrooms, mental health counseling, or the needs of queer and trans students of color in in particular? Um, Yeah, I think we should have... um, more bathrooms built for um, that are inclusive, you know, not just men and women. I know we have some um, bathroom spaces that are, uh, what's it called, all gender, but we don't have a lot of those. There's, they're not in like every single building. They're only in certain select buildings and it is always the parts of campus that nobody is at. <laughs> so I would say definitely we need more of um, more inclusive bathrooms. Um, but we also, I would say, need um, a little bit more queer staff. I would say uh, we have 
we have some we have some um like we have like i would say like a good handful but i would say um i know at pride center we have um we have um a therapist who is queer affirming um and i think we have a one queer affirming counselor but that is two people for the entire pride center doing therapy and counseling i would say they would probably need at least like i don't know three queer affirming counselors two therapists so sorry i think we got cut off there but um is there anything else you want to say about what the college could do to make trans and queer students feel more included um i think we covered everything with like the counseling therapy and bathrooms okay um and then i wanted to give you an opportunity to if there was any questions you wanted questions or topics that you wanted to return to anything you want to say that we haven't addressed in general Mm. i think one more thing we should do is um more housing relief funds i wouldn't say that just applies to colleges i would say like the state of california in general should provide um housing relief funds for um trans and queer youth who maybe have live in households that aren't expecting of who they are who may be abusive or maybe even kick them out um i would say that is uh something we should um put a little bit more money aside for you know so we don't have any more homeless uh, trans people or homeless um, queer people, you know, because that is uh, essentially for the sad reality for a lot of people and why it is difficult for them to ever come out to their parents because then they won't have housing. So I would, yeah, I would say that's another reason why I think us community colleges having some sort of like small side of dorms for um, students who are houseless or students who are um, struggling in their current housing situation, it's it's really important so that way they can be safe. Okay, thank you.